Dog. The day is July 4th, 1999, right. America's Independence Day. The location at Yervin, Colorado. It's a nice day with a high of 90 degrees. One family wanted to take advantage of this, and so before they went out to go watch their fireworks later that night, they all decided to go swimming in a locally known swimming hole. This is where the family would discover a pickup truck resting at the bottom of the muddy water. Not sure what to make of it, the family called the police. The local sheriff's department would be the first to respond to this scene. The truck ended up belonging to a man named Dale Williams, someone who had officially been declared missing just six weeks prior. Dale owned an auto body shop and was working at the time of his disappearance. One of his friends, who he had hired, was working with him at the time and recalls exactly what happened that day. The two were sitting in the office when the phone to the auto body shop started ringing. Dale picked it up and began talking. Now, his friend couldn't hear everything that was said, but Dale would give him a short summary when he finished the call. The caller claimed to be stranded in what's known as Paradox Valley, which was north of Dale's shop. Their motorcycle had broken down on them, and they were requesting a tow, which Dale agreed to help out with. He then set out. This call would be the last call Dale would ever answer. Jesus! He never came home that night. His wife would call him multiple times, but to no avail. Dale had disappeared without a trace. He was officially declared missing that night, and over the next few days, a search consisting of hundreds of volunteers commenced, though not a single clue would result. This leads us back to six weeks later when Dale's truck was found in the water by a local family swimming. It was determined that at the time the truck entered the water, the ignition was on, and at a very low crawl speed, the wheel was turned at a sharp angle towards the water. This discovery led a lot of people to believe the truck ending up in the water was not an accident. Over the years, multiple different theories have surfaced under this belief. For example, some believe he's living on an island somewhere. Others believe he faked his own death and ran off with some other woman. But probably the theory with the most traction is someone wanted him dead, and that someone was the person who called his shot that day claiming to be a stranded motorist, ultimately luring Dale to his death. Interestingly, Dale had two daughters, and somewhat recently, one of them took to Reddit under the sub r slash askmeanything. She gave the whole story, and comments started flooding in. One commenter asked her what she herself believes happened to her dad. She would simply reply, I think he was murdered. Why or by who, I don't know. Some speculate the person responsible was a man that was one of Dale's ex-friends. One year before Dale had gone missing, him and his wife had helped move the man's ex-wife away from him out of state to safety without his knowledge. This clearly made the man angry, as a month after the move, he put torn up pictures of the four of them next to bullets all scattered on the ground of Dale's shop. So clearly a motive is there. And it turns out that after Dale's disappearance, he was even captured taking down missing posters of Dale around the town. He was brought in for questioning, but denied any involvement. He ended up passing a polygraph test, and supposedly had an alibi around the time Dale went missing. Thus, he would be ruled out by law enforcement. To this day, it's unknown where Dale is, or who called his shot the day of his disappearance. He probably lived for the best time of his life. <laughs> Back in 1991, a then 22-year-old named Angela Hammond was living in Clinton, Missouri. She was a student at Central Missouri State University, meanwhile also working at a bank. On April 4th, Angela and her fiancé, Rob Schaefer, had plans to go to a barbecue together. He sucks! When it started wrapping up, Rob knew he had to get home, because he was supposed to be watching his little brother until his mom got home. That's cap! Angela dropped him off at his house, but the two still wanted to hang out. They decided that Angela would call him in a few hours to work out a spot where they could meet downtown. Meanwhile, Rob would watch his brother. Cut to a few hours later, and sure enough, Rob's phone started ringing. Now, again, this was 1991, so Angela was calling from a payphone rather than a cell phone. She was using one that was located in the center of town, only seven blocks from Rob's house. The two started discussing where they wanted to meet up, but after a few minutes, Angela mentioned a truck she saw that had circled the block a few times in a row now. Rob would later say that she described it as a green pickup with this really distinct decal of a fish jumping out of the water, covering the entire back window. 
Though, it wasn't until it parked right next to her that she became genuinely concerned. A man got out and briefly used the second payphone just next to her. He then went back to his car and pulled out a flashlight as if he was looking for something. Rob listened as Angela asked the man if he needed to use the phone, assuming the one he had tried to use was broken. The man responded saying it was fine, and that he would try again in a minute. Rob and Angela continued their conversation, not thinking much about the encounter. Hell, that's... But shortly after, the sound of Angela screaming shot through the line. Hey, Mo. Hey, Mo. That's got to be one of the most scariest, traumatizing sounds you could probably ever hear. Ever hear. You're on your phone. You're on the phone with your significant other or somebody that you love, right? A friend, family, whoever. And you just hear them screaming at the top of their lungs. You know how scary that shit is? Oh, I'm dropping all shits. And I'm whole ass and I'm going through every red light. I'm going through every, every stop. So I don't get clucked. Without even thinking, Rob immediately dropped the phone and got in his car to drive the seven blocks to the payphone. We made it about halfway when he noticed a pickup truck speed past him in the other direction. Not only that, but he also reported to have heard a panicked woman's voice screaming his name out of the window. Rob threw his car in reverse and began chasing down the pickup. But what he didn't know at the time is that him throwing his car into reverse as fast as he did had severely damaged the transmission. Two miles into the chase and his car began to stall. Eventually, his car came to a complete stop. He watched as the truck's taillights faded into the distance. Authorities were almost immediately notified of the situation. Over the next few days, a Missouri State Highway Patrol checked hundreds of registered trucks matching the description Rob gave them, but none of them were a match. Unfortunately, blame would start to shift towards Rob himself. Police suspected he had made the whole story up, and in reality, he was responsible for Angela's disappearance. Though, in only a week, this leak would get thrown out. Two witnesses in the area at the time had come out reporting to have seen a truck matching the description Rob gave. And in addition, Rob had also now passed a polygraph test. Over the years, there have been many different unconfirmed sightings of Angela in different states. But whether these are real sightings or not is unknown. As far as we know, that phone call Rob and Angela had on the night of her disappearance would be the last phone call she would ever make. What year was that? My, the 70s? University, meanwhile also working at a bank. On April 4th, Angela and her fiance, Rob Schaefer, had, or who called his shop the day of his disappearance. Angela and her fiance, Rob Schaefer, had plans to go to a barbecue together. When it started wrapping up, Rob knew he had to get home because he was supposed to be watching his little brother until his mom got home. Angela dropped him off at his house but the two still wanted to hang and circled the block a few times in a row now, concerned. A man got out and briefly used the second payphone just next to her. He then went back to his car and pulled out a flashlight as if he was looking for something, covering the entire back window. Truck she saw then and circled the block a few times in a row, located in the center of town, only seven blocks from Rob's house, while Rob would watch his brother. Cut to a few hours later, and sure enough, Rob's phone started ringing. Now, again, this was 1991. 1991. 1991. It's 2022. Damn. I hope she's not dead, though. First, as fast as the description Rob gave for make. Because you can receive phone calls from pretty much anyone, it's not always easy to keep yourself protected. It's May 14, 2008. Right. Brandon Swanson, a student at Minnesota West Community and Technical College, is out celebrating the end of spring semester with a few other students. Around 1 a.m., Brandon finally starts to head home, which was located in Marshall, Minnesota. He was currently in Canby, Minnesota, so it was about a 30-minute drive to his home. At some point during this drive, Brandon mistakenly swerves into a ditch on the side of the road. Jesus. He was unhurt and there was no damage to his car, but he couldn't move it. It was stuck. 
He then gets out and manually attempts to free it by himself, but he can't. He calls some of his nearby friends, but none of them answer. This left him with no other option but to call his parents, and so he does. He explains his situation and tells them he's somewhere near the city of Lind. While staying on the line, his parents start driving there to pick him up. But when they arrive, Brandon and his car were nowhere to be found. After a while, Brandon began flashing his headlights, and his parents started to do the same, but still they couldn't see each other. Brandon told them that he could see city lights off in the distance, and believing they were from the city of Lind, he told his parents that he would just walk there and meet them at a well-known bar in the area. He got out of his car and started walking on gravel roads towards the city. Though, Brandon would eventually decide to cut through a field, believing that it would be faster than just staying on the road. Oh my god! Still on the phone with his parents, Brandon would know nearby fences and water while in the field. Then, at the 47 minute mark in the call, Brandon abruptly yelled out, Oh shit! Before the line went completely silent. Again! That is something you do not want to hear from a loved one. For example, you don't want to hear, Ah! You don't want to hear, oh shit. You don't want to hear, damn. You don't want to hear, clock. You don't want to, you, you don't want to hear, ew. You don't want to hear, 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 hoo -ha! You don't want to hear, you don't want to hear, hoo -ha! You don't want to hear, <laughs> right before the phone cuts off. His parents called out to him several times, but there was no response. They then ended the call and repeatedly tried to call him back, but once again, there was no response. Brandon was never successfully contacted for the whole rest of that night. He would be officially declared missing early the next morning. Police got involved, and oddly, when they tracked his phone calls, they were traced to a cell tower in a completely different location than what he told his parents. Brandon was over 25 miles away in a city named Porter when he called his parents. With this information, police searched the new area, and sure enough, they found Brandon's car stuck in a ditch. But Brandon himself was nowhere to be found. Police dogs were brought in to assist in the search. The dogs traced a scent straight to a nearby river, the Yellow Medicine River, which was at its highest point during this time of the year. Immediately, it was assumed Brandon had fallen into the river, but the scent had actually continued on towards a different gravel road where it finally stopped. Still, many believe Brandon had fallen into the river and ultimately drowned. Except, during the phone call with his parents, they would recall no sounds of rushing water around the time he went silent. Plus, at no point was a body or even clothing found in the river, which almost surely would have surfaced. There are countless other theories out there, mainly due to how popular this case has gotten. But what really happened, or what Brandon had seen during that final phone call, remains unknown. Yo, he's missing. February 19, 1983. Oh. A 10-year-old, Joanne Pedersen, was spending the evening at a local mall with her 12-year-old sister and 14-year-old cousin. Damn. Her parents were out for the night, meaning the three would be left to walk the short distance home themselves. As they were doing so, Joanne and her sister would get into an argument. This led her sister and cousin to run ahead and lock Joanne out of the house as a sort of childish joke. Wow! But it was cold and raining that night. Crying, Joanne pounded on the door for some time, but soon just gave up. She decided she'd walk back into town to look for a payphone that she could use to call her parents. She started walking and eventually came across the phone just next to a convenience store. Joanne called her stepfather, who answered right away. She would tell him about the altercation with her sister and how she needed to be picked up. Joanne's stepfather assured her they'd come get her as soon as possible. To calm her down, he then handed the phone to her mother. But when Joanne's mother put the phone to her ear, all she could hear was scratching and rustling. Oh, then God. there was a man's voice. He told her that if they didn't come to pick up their daughter in 30 minutes, he was going to call the police. The two arrived to the payphone around 15 to 20 minutes later, yet Joanne was nowhere to be seen. Her parents contacted the police and a search was commenced almost immediately. Everyone that entered that convenience store that night was interviewed. Some reported to have seen a car with a man and child driving off right past the store. Others reported to have actually seen the man talking on the payphone with Joanne, even giving a description of what he looked like. 
though he was never identified. Who this man actually was remains a mystery, but it's not even clear if he had any part in Joanne's disappearance. None of the witnesses interviewed actively saw Joanne being taken. Joanne has since never been seen. The call she placed that night would be the last time her parents or anyone ever heard from her. What year? Oh, what year was that? Go back. Wait. She was. She was ten. February nineteen, nineteen eighty-three. Nineteen eighty-three. Nineteen eighty-three. How old are you now? Okay. I gotta do some math. Hold on. Almost fifty, right? Forty-nine, fifty, almost fifty, right? I would think. I think so. Based. Oh my God! Damn. Wait a minute, and wait a minute, cause I'm about to be real mad. Do we get into an argument? This led her sister and cousin to run ahead and lock Joanne out of the house as this a childish joke. So, because they was playing a childish joke, because they were playing a joke on their little sister, she got kidnapped for, for decades. What, for over 40 years? Give or take. Because they because they thought it was a good it was a joke. I hope her siblings never live this down. Cause all of that could have been complete. Oh my god. All of that could have been like avoided if they just brought her in a couple seconds earlier. Or they just opened the door a couple seconds earlier. Like, oh my god. But then a part of me thinks like, why wouldn't you just wait? But then Part of me also thinks maybe she wanted to get kidnapped. A part of me thinks that maybe it wasn't so good at the house, you know? And a part of me thinks that I hope, hopefully she's still alive. But that was messed up. Because y'all was playing a joke, she's been gone for so long. Y'all probably don't even recognize her no more. If she ever comes back around. Oh my god. Oh my god. That shit's crazy. Yo, these missing for these these are like these are missing four one one four one one cases. That's crazy how somebody can be somewhere in one second, then the other second they out of there. That's crazy as hell. That's so crazy, cause I don't understand how that happened. Like, oh my God, God forbid, I do not want to be a part of that, but I just don't understand how somebody can be gone that fast. That's crazy as shit. And right before I started recording videos just now, I got an Amber Alert on my phone. Jesus. God, watch your peoples. Watch your peoples, please. Keep cool, keep it passing. I love you, stay happy, my family.